Good evening and welcome everybody to uh, this week's talk about the Blenheim Christmas. So I'll be speaking to you this evening about how Christmas has been celebrated at Blenheim um, from Victorian times and how we mark it today, um, even in this very, very peculiar year. Um, I'm just going to wait for a moment for people to um, come on board. But while we're waiting, just to explain that you have the facility to ask questions if you use the Q&A little box that, on your um, Zoom toolbar. So do submit questions as we go along or pop something into the chat and there'll be time at the end of this um, for me to answer your questions. So anyway, so how has Christmas been celebrated at Blenheim? Well, you can imagine that preparing for Christmas, uh, you know what's involved when you're getting ready for your own family Christmases. If you multiply that up many, many times, that's the sort of thing that has to go on at Blenheim. Now, um, Christmas trees form a large part of our traditional Christmas and our Christmas ce celebration. And right back from Georgian times, so from the 1700s, um, there was perhaps a small tree to be found on the dining table at Christmas. This was a tradition that was brought over by Caroline of Brunswick. But certainly in Victorian times, um, the seventh Duke and Duchess in particular, who were here from the middle of the 1800s um, until 1883, they followed the tradition that was introduced by their great friend, Queen Victoria and her husband, Albert, and they would have a Christmas tree, a decorated tree in the palace. And in those days, they didn't have fairy lights, they had candles. And I can certainly remember Christmases where, with candles um, on our Christmas tree at home when I was a child. And the thought of that nowadays just makes me shiver. You know, how we didn't, how we weren't burnt to a crisp is beyond me. So um, they would have candles, they would have dried fruit as decorations, um, they would have other decorations made out of tin and leather and various other things. Um, and it was a, a mainstay. Now, the ninth Duke, who was Duke from 1892, until 1934, um, also used to have a little Christmas tree for his spaniels. And you can see there, the Duke's just over to the one side of the screen. Um, there are the Blenheim Spaniels. And there's this little Christmas tree, again, with live candles. So heaven knows what would have happened if one of those little Spaniels had knocked into the tree. Um, candles had fallen on the floor and goodness knows where we would have been very different story today. We still have Christmas trees. The trees are grown um, for the large part on the estate and um, they come to, to us as saplings and they grow for six to ten years. And what I didn't realise until quite recently is that Christmas trees have to be helped to get into a Christmas tree shape. Now I thought it was a perfectly natural thing and they just grew like that. In fact our foresters have to keep trimming them and shaping them so that they grow into the beautiful trees that I'm sure you have in your home today. Um, it was always the tradition with Blenheim that they would supply Christmas trees to the local schools. Um, we still supply a Christmas tree today to the town of Woodstock and local charities. And one of the things that I love at Christmas is going along and choosing my Blenheim tree. And we have a gift every year, every member of staff um, is entitled to have a tree. So that's rather lovely as well. Um, we, we use a lot of trees in our decorations at Blenheim. And this year, I have it on good authority from my colleagues that we have 42 trees. And um, Kate Ballinger, who, who's my colleague who oversees all this, also told me that she has 5,000 meters of fairy lights and 10,000 baubles. Now, I put my tree up the other day and I came across this cluster of fairy lights, which of course last year when I took the tree down, I just bundled, bundled it and thought, oh, worry about that next year. Now, can you imagine that with 
thousand meters of lights. It's a nightmare. Now, the ninth duke, um, let's say the gentleman that you can see tucked away entertaining his spaniels, was a very, very warm and welcoming host. And all the Dukes of Marlborough have enjoyed celebrating Christmas at Blenheim. And you can imagine what a magical place it is at this time of year. Um, and he was very lavish and he would invite his friends, um, their children, and their, his friends would come along and they would bring with them um, horses for themselves, horses for the children, and they would bring a whole entourage of servants. Now, I would guess that some of you are Downton Abbey fans. Um, and it always makes me smile that when visitors come to Downton, they seem to travel quite lightly and bring only one person with them. Um, you know, a valet or a, a lady's maid or whatever. Um, but I have it here just an extract from a book written by the daughter of one of these guests. She was actually here in 1901. And she says that Christmas at Blenheim was something to be treasured all year round. Um, and she went on to say that, as I said, the Duke would invite not only his friends, but also their children. Um, he, they would also bring their horses and ponies, which meant that an entourage of grooms and other servants would all also be brought along. And they would all have to be housed and fed for the 10 day duration of their stay. Because of course you couldn't just jump into your car and drive off and then turn around and come home again in the evening. So um, these stays went on for over a week. So the, word, the one most guilty of bringing lots of people was this gentleman here on the right. He was Lord Bir Birkenhead or Effie Smith, as he was uh, rightly known and called by his friends. Um, and it says Effie would arrive with four hunters, two for himself, two for his wife. He would bring two ponies, three grooms, two nurses, a maid and a valet. All the other guests took the same entourage, and at least on one occasion, 100 guests slept at Blenheim Palace. Now, I think what you need to take into account was that the guests, the, the people that were actually invited per se, were housed beautifully and would have had lovely room and um, whatever. Now, the maids and the grooms and the people they brought with them would have caused all sorts of problems really for the Blenheim staff because the Blenheim staff, the Blenheim servants would have had to share their accommodation with the visiting servants. So you can imagine they were already two or three to a room. And when these other people came as well, they would have to share that room with them as well. Um, so I can imagine it was it was quite a tight squeeze. Um, one of the things that would have been problematic, and again, if you imagine the number of people involved, at this stage in Blenheim's history, there was only one bathroom. So the maids um, would have been occupied for an awful lot of time, running up and down the stairs, carrying um, big kind of cans of water baths um, and they would not only have to fill the baths so they would have to empty them as well so there would it would have been such a busy time such a kerfuffle um, it was a very formal occasion so the footmen um, who had to be at least six feet tall they were required even in those days to powder their hair now that in itself was a whole palaver so they would wash their hair um, and while it was still wet, they would apply powder. And it was a mixture of something called violet powder and starch. And then they would leave it to dry and it would set hard like concrete. So it was incredibly uncomfortable for them. Um, and again, in Eleanor's, Eleanor Smith's book, she goes on to say, on one of the Christmas visits, a housemaid went mad. 
He went screaming through the staterooms, pursued by grim, powder-headed footmen. Her screams were terrible to hear. And once she'd been cornered in the third stateroom by the footman, enveloped in billows of hair powder, she was carried away kicking and screaming like a trapped hare. She was carried bodily through the pantry door. And she was never seen again. Now, I dread to think what happened to that poor maid, but I would imagine that carrying all that water for all those baths probably tipped her right over the edge. Now, you can see in this photograph, um, you've got a series of people. Um, this gentleman on the left here with the moustache is Winston Churchill's brother, Jack, and he's holding the hand of one of his little, little sons. Um, the Ninth Duke is at the back here in the centre with the moustache, and just in front of him is his son and heir, Lord Blandford, who went on to become the 10th Duke of Marlborough. Um, and just over to the Duke's left, again, this lady with the, the hat and the veil um, is Clemmy, uh, Winston Churchill's wife, Clementine. And they're all getting ready to go out on a paper chase. So, Again, if you think in those days there was no TV or PlayStation or you know, the sort of entertainment that families indulge in today. So um, the Duke had to keep his guests amused. And one of the things they would do would be to set up a paper chase. So a paper chase would involve them, um, someone going out and laying literally a trail of paper around the park. And they would get off on their horses and the, the person who was laying the paper was the hare and the rest of the company were chasing them. And they had a great time, great time galloping around the estate, you can imagine. Um, one of the highlights as well for the children was that in the evening, there would be a torchlight procession down to the lake. And in those days, the lake really, really did used to freeze over. It was absolutely solid and they would go ice skating. Um, and Eleanor Smith describes you know, these little figures skating on the ice with their torches and they look like fireflies. It sounded absolutely magical. Now, when people came to Blenheim, they would be asked to sign the Duke's visitor's book. And now this to, to us has provided a wonderful record of who visited Blenheim, when they visited, and you can tell also how long they stayed. But one of the lovely things, I think, is that you can trace how people, how a family develops. And so here we have the signature of Winston Churchill and Clementine Churchill. Now, this was um, this was in about 1912. But before that, there had been evidence of Winston signing his name when he was a little boy, then when he was a young man. Then when he became a married man and suddenly you see Clementine signing her name. But here, the really lovely thing is that Diana was their oldest daughter. And then Diana had a little brother called Randolph and she has clearly written his name for him because he can't write. She's got him to draw a little cross, show that he was there. And next to it, she's just written his mark. I think it's absolutely charming. Now, going on from this, so we're, we're kind of early 1900s. Sadly, in 1914, everything changed and it was the first Christmas of the First World War. And if you look closely at this, this photograph, it's a photograph that was taken in the Long Library at Blenheim Palace. Right at the back, you can see the amazing Willis organ, which was relatively new in those days. It was, um, it was actually installed in 1891, um, but in those days it was, it was only, it was less than 20 years old. Um, and sitting, playing the organ, is a man called Mr Perkins. And in that first Christmas, there were up to 50 men convalescing in the Long Library at Blenheim. And you can see again in the center here, there's a dark, uh, a lady in a dark dress. And this was Sister Mun, and she was in charge of the hospital. And she was very forward thinking, and she knew that it was really important 
not only to look after the men's physical wounds and to heal those, but also to heal their mental wounds. And she believed it was really important to get out in the fresh air. Um, you know, and again, heaven knows that over the last few months, I think many of us have really enjoyed getting out into the fresh air, blowing the cobwebs away. And it really does help you feel better and raise your spirits. And the Duke was also of this opinion. And so he provided, he bought bath chairs for them so they could get out and about. He bought footballs for them so they could play out in the grounds. They used to fish the lakes, um, the lake. But one of the things that they really enjoyed was one of the Blenheim staff was a man called Mr. Scroggs. And there have been Scroggs working at Blenheim Palace for over a hundred years. Until a few years ago, we still had one of the Scroggs family working for us, a young lad called Charlie. But the particular Scroggs that was at Blenheim at this time had an elixir that he used to brew for the patients. Um, and it was beer. And so um, we have a wonderful album at Blenheim that has a register of all the people that were convalescing there. Um, there are lots and lots of photographs. There are lots of letters of thanks from the soldiers when they were um, healed and back out again. And um, there are quite a number of them mentioned Scroggs and his ale and what a tonic it was. So I like to think that, um, that that was an added bonus, really. But this, this Christmas card, well, it, it is in effect a Christmas card. At the bottom, it says, from your hospital staff, Christmas 1914. And there have been a series of Christmas cards, which kind of just mark what is going on in the family or in the greater world. Um, and I just want to show you a few of them. So. This card is from 1957, and it shows the 10th Duchess's Datsuns. And those of you that know me will know that I'm a huge Datsun fan. So that's the only reason I've really included that, rather nice. So uh, 1957, 10th Duchess, she was the grandmother of our present Duke. Now coming forward somewhat in time, we come to 1996. And this is the Christmas card that His Grace, the 11th Duke of Marlborough, the father of our present Duke, sent out. And it's, it's quite a peculiar card and lets you know what happened during that year. And in fact, 1996 was when Kenneth Branagh came to Blenheim and filmed Hamlet. And at four hours long, it's the longest movie made in England. Um, and the figure that you see at the back there, riding on his own, is the 11th Duke of Marlborough. And he had a cameo role in the film. And he was very, very proud of the fact that he did. And so this was his Christmas card for that year, which was rather nice, I thought. Then coming forward to 2004, it's the Duke on horseback again, but in a, a very, very different guise. And this time he's dressed as his ancestor, John Churchill, because 2004 was the tercentenary of the Battle of Blenheim, taken place in August 1704. And so the Duke was paying respect to his ancestor, because if it hadn't been for John Churchill, the first Duke, then Blenheim Palace wouldn't have been there. So moving forward again, and this really was a spectacular event. We had the Olympic torch at Blenheim Palace. Um, this was in 2012 when Britain did exceptionally well in the Olympics. Um, and there was the Olympic torch being handed over. Uh, the torch bearers had run into the park and they lit up the, the torch again. Off they went on the next leg. And there's the Duke standing there looking very, very pleased with himself and very pleased with the whole day. So that was jolly good. So that's just a little bit about Christmas cards. Who knows what this year's card will bring? It should be quite a, a challenge, I think, to, to just kind of represent this year on a Christmas card. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the Bothy Boys. Now, working at Blenheim is it's a wonderful thing to do. And one day is never the same as the next. And I was at Blenheim 
one day minding my own business and someone came and found me and they said, Antonia, there's, there's a gentleman in the Great Hall who used to work at Blenheim. Would you like to come and say hello to him? So I said, yes, I would. And so I, I toddled off and it was a, a lovely 90 year old called Ron Petch. And he had come to Blenheim for a day's visit and he had amazingly brought with him photographs and lots of memories. And the young man on the left of the picture with his hands in his pockets is Ron Petch when he came and worked at Blenheim in 1938. And he was a gardener. Um, and the young gardeners, and there were a group of six of them used to share a house or a bothy down at the Pleasure Gardens. And they were known as the Bothy Balls. And Ron had such a good memory. He, he was absolutely wonderful. And I spoke to him about various things. And I spoke to him about Christmas. And he said how it was part of his job to look after the poinsettias and cyclamens and chrysanthemums that the 10th Duchess liked to have in the palace at Christmas. And they took great pride in providing these wonderful flowers for her. The Bothy boys, were all very young men and for some of them it was the first time they were away from home and so they did have the opportunity to go home for Christmas but they all loved being at Blenheim so much that they didn't and they all used to stay for Christmas and they had the day off. One person had to be on duty so, um, to look after the boilers and the greenhouses and things and so they got a 10 shilling bonus for that so they got 50 p for working on Christmas day. The rest of them would have a nice leisurely morning and then the Duke would send down from the palace their lunch. So they would have a Christmas dinner of turkey with all the trimmings, they would have bottles of beer, they would have Christmas pudding and that was their gift from the Duke and they thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Now that was going on down at Bothy. Up at the palace, the table was being decorated ready for Christmas. And you can see in the center some of the poinsettias that Ron would have sent up. Now, again, this is looking at the 1950s, um, late 1950s, early 1960s. And the 10th Duchess always liked to have centerpiece that was topical. So um, she had her electrical foreman and they would together sit down and con concoct a design and then he would go off and create something special for the Duchess. And this particular year, you can see it's a globe. And this little round thing here is a ping pong ball that was attached. So it looked as though it was um, going round and round the globe. And it was the year that the Russians first put a Sputnik into space. Then another year, um, they came up with a design of the Grand Bridge. And then just to give a nod to that this year, because we're working on the Grand Bridge, this is what my colleague Carmen has come up with. And this is the display that if you go to the palace, not today, it, or not now, because it's closed, but if you go there tomorrow, that's the centerpiece. And just to do a close up, there's the Grand Bridge right in the middle of it. And if you look very closely, um, we've got a bit of a mice theme for the, children in the palace this year um, and you've got these three tiny mice and one of them is wearing a mask because they're indoors and we're like we're trying to keep it topical as well. So let's talk about the family's Christmas. So how do the how do the Marlborough family treat Christmas Day? So again going back to the 1950s when all the young children were at home, there were five children at home, they would wake up and they would find a stocking at the end of their bed and there'd be an orange in the end of the stocking and various other bits and pieces. And then the morning was spent helping their mother, the 10th Duchess, in Woodstock where she would um, organise um, a, a meal and things for local people. Um, and the children would go along and give out oranges. At lunchtime, the family would gather in the bow window room over on the private side of the palace, wonderful tree in the bow window, and they would have their meal. 
So this is what lunch would look like. So you can see it starts off with pate, with smoked salmon, and then you've got turkey with all the trimmings, followed by Christmas pudding, brandy sauce. So that's the, the more traditional Christmas dinner, if you will, or Christmas meal, I should say. Then, if we look in the evening, this is a more recent photograph of what the family table looks like. Now, you know Christmas doesn't happen by accident. And so this will have been the culmination of several days preparation. And certainly in the 50s and 60s, one of the big things that took people's time was looking after the fires in the saloon. So this room is the saloon in the palace, so it's the formal dining room. Um, and certainly in the 50s and 60s, the fires used to smoke like Billy Ho. And so um, the palace administrator at the time was a man called Archie Illingworth. And he would get the fires going continuously from about three days before Christmas. And he'd start off, he'd get up at five o'clock in the morning and just make sure that they didn't smoke. And um, so this would go, go on and on. Everybody, it was all hands on deck. And the staff would love working at Christmas. And it was like, it really was like one big happy family. And even until recently, um, I spoke to uh, the Duke chef a couple of years ago. And he was saying that he would set his alarm for five o'clock in the morning and wake his children up. And he said, I must be one of the only fathers in the whole country that has to wake his young children up on Christmas morning. He bundled them into the back of the car with sleeping bags and all their toys, deposit them in the palace, and then he would set about getting the ovens warm and making bacon rolls for the other staff, making breakfast for the family upstairs. Um, and he would prepare lunch. The, the rest of the staff normally have a sit down lunch um, over on the private side. On Christmas Day, the chef would make something easy like shepherd's pie so they could just dip in and out and grab a plateful and get on with their jobs as it were. And then eventually in the evening, the Duke and his family would sit down to a buffet. And this is the sort of thing that you would expect to appear on the buffet table on Christmas evening. So you have soup, you've got turkey, ham, tongue, beef, lamb, chicken, partridge, Smoked salmon again, lobster salad, potted shrimps, baked potatoes, green salad. I hope, I hope you've had your dinner. Um, free bean salad, mayonnaise, various sauces, and then hot black cherries, chestnut ice cream, mince pies, warm brandy and cream. And then this is a, a picture of them all tucking in and enjoying themselves. And this is one of my favourite pictures. And you can see the family, as I say, this would have been back in the, probably in the 70s. And they're all wearing these wonderful paper hats. So like the rest of us, they pull crackers, they put on their hats. Um, but it always amuses me that in the time of the 10th Duke, it used to be a family tradition that one of the grandchildren would try and set fire to the Duke's hat without him realising. And of course, he always did realise, you know, managed to, to put it out before it caused any, any awful damage. Um, but there we are. So it wasn't a good time to be a child necessarily at this time. So while this was going on downstairs in the saloon, you were only allowed down when um, you were old enough to go to public school. And so until you were 13 years of age or even slightly older if you were a girl, then you had your meal in the nursery with Nanny. And it was, a, you can see by the, the menu that's written here, this goes back to 1964, that it wasn't quite such, a, such an elaborate affair. Now, once the family had had their Christmas, then the staff get on and have their Christmas. And certainly going back to the time um, of the Ninth Duke in the early 1900s, the servants would sit down and the hierarchy in the servants' hall was as strict, if not stricter, than the hierarchy um, above stairs. So if 
you were a visiting servant and you're, you were employed by a lord or another duke or whatever, then you were far further up the pecking order than if you were employed by a plain mister. Um, so all that had to be taken into account. The junior servants would wait on the senior servants and eventually when everything else was, was done, the junior servants could sit down and have their meal. And um, the staff at Blenheim, again, this is going, this particular picture is going back to the 1950s, always used to have a Christmas party after Christmas. Um, and in fact, that's something that happens, um, well, it's not gonna happen this year, but uh, it's something that happened earlier this year. So it, our 2019 Christmas was celebrated in January 2020. And this is a, a rather wonderful photograph of the staff party and they're playing Splat the Kipper. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but it's a game where you have a piece of paper shaped like a kipper. Um, you put it on the floor, you have a newspaper and you whack the floor around your kipper and hoping to raise enough air, enough thrust to get your kipper over the winning line. But what I really love about this is there's the Duke, the 10th Duke with his kipper. Um, in the background here, looking on with amusement is Lord Blanford, who became the 11th Duke. And there you have Lord Charles, Lord Blanford's younger brother. And again, they're all, you know, they're all in there. They're all getting stuck in. And there's the Duchess sitting down after all her labors, all her preparations um, and looking on with enjoyment. And most of them are smoking, which of course you wouldn't get indoors nowadays. Um, there's Lord Charles looking after his guests and supplying them with nibbles. Um, and there's Lord Charles again. This is Archie Illingworth, who the gentleman that used to get up and look after the fires and make sure they weren't smoking and spluttering and sparking. And again, there's the Duchess looking on fondly, I like to think. So that's the family, that's the staff. Let's again go back in time and, and see what happened with the children. So going back to the seventh Duke and Duchess of Marlborough, the ones that I mentioned who are good friends with Queen Victoria, um, Winston Church's grandparents, they were, they did an awful lot of good in the Woodstock area and particularly the Duchess was very keen on education and educating the local children and they were, were, were responsible for founding a number of schools in the area including Woodstock School and at Christmas time the children always had a tree and this is a diary entry of um, the ninth Duke of Marlborough's clerk Mr Fines and you can see it's dated Wednesday, the 8th of January, 1908. And it talks about the treat for the children. So there were 305 children. Um, the food was provided by the Bear Hotel and it cost a shilling a head, so six, uh, sorry, 5p um, a head. And the children had tea, cake, bread and butter and pastry and an orange to take home. And the total cost came to 15 pounds and five shillings, which is the equivalent of about 2000 pounds today. Um, so that, was, that wasn't staff children, that was school children from the surrounding area. So I think that's a rather nice thing to have. Um, in the 1950s, there started to be a children's party for staff. And it was all rather grand. You can see in this top left-hand photograph, the children are all assembled in the Great Hall, which is the first room that you come into when you come into Blenheim Palace. Um, and there's an awful lot going on. And then, then they got to sit at the saloon table and um, that's where they had their party tea. So it must have been quite something. Um, and in fact, it's a tradition that we carry on today. But you'll notice that the children in this picture, which was probably taken about seven or eight years ago, are sitting on a carpet rather than um, sitting at the saloon table. But then there are quite a few of them now. Lots of children of staff 
um, etc. And spoiler alert, we have a Father Christmas who visits every year and he may be a member of staff. And you can see Father Christmas is sitting there and this little girl here didn't recognize that Father Christmas bore a strange resemblance to her father. Enough said. So let's come full circle, let's come up to today. So how do we celebrate Christmas at Blenheim today? Blenheim's changed, it, it continues to change and it has to change in order to survive. And nowadays we are open for every day of the year except Christmas Day. And I say every day, this year has been slightly different. We haven't been open quite as much as we would normally expect to be. But um, so we're open every day. And so Christmas for us starts in January because that's when we sit down and we start planning what's going to happen the following Christmas. So um, we decorate the palace for Christmas. And over the last couple of years, we've really, really gone to town on it. And we've, we've got a company to come in and create a real fairy tale Christmas for us. So this year would have been our third, but we've, we've had to change things slightly because of COVID. But last year, the theme was Alice in Wonderland. So Alice in the Palace. And the year before that, we had a real fairy tale Christmas. You can see in the long library, there were trees and there was dance music and, and there was a clock ticking. Cinderella had to be out of there before midnight. And it was really magical. I mean, it was such a wonderful thing to come and see. So Christmas has gone full circle. It really, really has. And I wonder, do any of you have any questions? I had some questions, um, I've had a couple of questions come through um, earlier today. And um, one of those questions was, would we, on the whole as staff, do staff generally prefer the thought of having Christmas as it was or how it is? Which is a very strange question in a way. Um, I mean, and I, I've chatted to, to various colleagues and Christmas is different for all of us in a way, but certainly the operations team are incredibly busy at Christmas because they're the ones that decorate the palace, they're the ones that see that everything is going well, etc. cetera. Um, so I think, you know, you could argue that Christmases in the old days were lovely when it was a family affair, but we've moved on from there and, and Blenheim has had to move on to survive. So it's different, isn't it? I mean, this Christmas is certainly different because we haven't had any of the Christmas markets that we would normally have. Um, we've limited the number of people that can come into the palace at any one time. So it'll be a strange Christmas, but a Christmas to remember, I would say. So moving on, we've, I've looked briefly at decorating the palace inside but what we also do now um which i think has been a, a huge success and, and something that people really enjoy is the light trail and so we decorate inside the palace and we also decorate the grounds and this is a, a photograph of the boathouse and do you remember i mentioned earlier about the ninth duke and his guests having a torchlight procession down to the lake and I suppose in a way it's as close as we'll get to that sort of thing. And the whole lights trail is just absolutely stunning. And it's on until January next year, so until next month. And it's well worth the walk. So um, book your tickets now. Well, I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about Blenheim at Christmas. Um, next week, we're going to actually have a recording of a talk, an interview that uh, we did back in the summer. And it's Sue Perkins and myself in um, talking about a book called A Pattern for Fashion. Um, I'll in, there'll be a live introduction. You will be able to submit questions, not to Sue, but certainly to me. So um, do join us in, if you can. And 
Oh, sorry, I have a, a, a question here. The title of the book that I mentioned by Eleanor Smith, it's called Life is a Circus. Now, I managed to get a copy by, if you go onto Google and type in Life is a Circus, Eleanor Smith, you may be able to get a second-hand, well, it will be a second-hand copy. Um, yeah, so worth trying, worth trying on eBay, certainly. I'm sure other auction sites are available. Um, so, as I say, hope to see you next week. Thank you very, very much indeed. And have a very, very, very Christmas.